Donnie and Dolly. The team is supported by ableauctions.ca. Closing your business, we can help. All of our guests today brought to you by Able Auctions, our title sponsor. If you own or manage a business anywhere in BC and you're thinking of closing, well, let the experts at Able Auctions help you out. Get your business assets sold by emailing sales at ableauctions.ca. That is sales at ableauctions.ca. Okay, I got to go to the Delaney's OK Tire in Langley inbox. Rick, oh man, your attempts to do the highlights with Taylor gone today was more porous than the Jim Benning Canucks. I miss Taylor. Mike, <laughs> slash, pause, Hawk from Poco. Yeah, he thought, he, he thought he'd get you me there, what? Mike. Uh, you didn't get me, Mike. Not this time. Solid five out of ten on the highlights, Ricky. Hey, hold it a second. I, I, I. What did I say? I'm the backup guy. I know. I'm not the guy in the front. I, I like this Mike guy in Poco. I told you I couldn't do it. I tried my best. That's all you can do. Yeah, you did. You tried your best. Your hardest. All right. What do we do now? We're bringing in Brendan Bachelor. Sportsnet 650's play-by-play guy. That's right. And where is he? Uh, Ryan, get him up. Oh, look at this. <laughs> Very beautiful. Just Where are you? Smooth operation here, man. I'm at home. I'm at oh, home. Oh, you look like you're in the studios at 6.50. No, 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 no. No, the studios? Are you kidding me? Well, okay. <laughs> you got a cat tree in the background. There well, you got a, you got, your headset is better than ours. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, people, viewers, and listeners should know, doing the highlights is way harder than you think oh, it is. Oh, like, super I hard. tried to do it when I was at BCIT. It's difficult. It's hard. And Donnie, for many years, had to do it on a delay. I know. That's it. For Sportsnet, which is, like, unfathomable to me. It takes an incredible amount of talent. And Donnie, is, as you know, Brendan, is the best in the biz. Not not only in Vancouver. Absolutely. Uh, British Columbia from here to Newfoundland. And, All right. And I'm very excited to hear this exciting news you guys will have coming yeah, up. 1130. Don't you say a word. or If you no, let the cat out of the bag, I'm telling you, Bachelor. <laughs> Lips are sealed. Lips are sealed. Okay, listen. Uh... Canucks win last night. They're off to a 4-2 and two start, which is nice. What's impressed you uh, the most uh, after six games? I think just their commitment to the staples of the game, as Rick Tockett always talks about. And it hasn't been perfect. The game in Philly, uh, you know, certainly was one to forget. And, um, you know, they, they improved, I think, ever since then. The Tampa Bay game was a little bit better. The Florida game was even better. And last night, limiting a team that was one of the top teams in terms of the number of shots they generate in the league. If I'm not mistaken, going into play yesterday, the Predators also had created more scoring chances than any other team in the league as well. You hold them to 17 shots. You look really consistent and solid defensively. You make it easy on Thatcher Demko and you pick up the win and come home four and two. It's been really impressive. And the fact that Tockett has these guys buying into the way they have to play away from the puck to me is the, the biggest noticeable difference from the way they played last year. Brendan, if, if you would have told me that Phil DiGiuseppe, who was in the minors not long ago, <laughs> okay, uh, the Canucks on a July 1st didn't even sign him until like two weeks later. This guy, 18 minutes last night on, on the Canucks top line, so many players that come into Vancouver from the minor leagues lasted one game, one shift, one period on the top line. They're back to the minors. This guy's keeping his position on the top line, 18 minutes last night, one goal. What a fabulous story he is. Absolutely. And to be honest, I always thought Phil DiGiuseppe could be a part of this team and on this roster because I think the past few years he had good training camps. I thought he had a good training camp in Travis Green's last year, didn't make the team that year. thought he had a good training camp last year with Bruce Boudreau, didn't get called up until Rick Tockett had arrived. But I never saw him as a consistent top six forward. I just thought, oh, this is a guy that could give them some better depth, maybe play more consistently on their fourth line, has a little bit of offensive upside. Uh, but him and Miller and Besser, the chemistry they've developed, the way they play together is allowing all three of them to have success. And you look at the start that Miller's had, you look at Besser filling the net, and Di Giuseppe complementing those two guys with the way that he plays. There's a reason to me that that line has been the Canucks' best line. And when you look at it, of all the lines the Canucks have constructed to this point in the season, there's really only one line that has two guys that are consistent on the four check that get in there, win puck battles, make it hard on the defense of the other team. And those two guys are JT Miller 
and Phil DiGiuseppe. So he deserves a ton of credit for the way he's played. It's nice to see him getting rewarded, and oh. it's nice to see the Canucks winning with him up the lineup too. Batch, uh, we got to talk about Quinn Hughes. I'm not going to ask where you think he ranks amongst defensemen in the <laughs> NHL. It's been talked about a lot this week. Uh, but it seems as though he's taken this captaincy and it's, it's, it's elevated him to a new gear that I didn't know. Maybe, maybe we knew he was possible, but it just seems like he's, he's taken the weight and it's fueling him on the ice, off the ice, whatever. His start to the year has just been amazing. Have you seen this new gear because of the captaincy, or do you think it's just his growth going on here? Well, I, probably a little bit of both. Like, I think the captaincy does play a factor, but, you know, Quinn Hughes is a supremely motivated guy. Uh, and he's someone that every year he's gone home and tried to work on something with his game. You know, it was a few years ago, his plus minus was really bad. I think that was the uh, the North Division season. And he took that sort of as a personal challenge that he need to get needed to get better defensively. And he has. Now he's looking to try and become more dynamic offensively. And we've seen that growth in his game where he's more aggressive, carrying the puck deep in the zone. He jumps up in the play very well. He's very effective in hard. And I think being paired with Philip Hironik has allowed him to have a little bit more leash to make some of those offensive plays because he trusts his defense partner. He knows the guy he has with him uh, is also capable of making those plays, but can bail him out if he's the guy rushing up into the play. And so the confidence he's playing with, you know, the the plays he's creating, whether it's him scoring himself or, you know, getting the shot through that ends up in the Niels Hoaglander goal last night. He's having an impact offensively on a nightly basis while playing a ton and him and Hironic have been playing well together. It's going to be interesting to see how long the coaching staff can keep those two guys on the same pairing because of, you know, some of the struggles they've had further down their lineup with the defensemen, but I have no complaints about the way Quinn Hughes and Philip Hironik are playing to this point in the season and playing so well together. I was just going to ask you about that. Do you keep that? I mean, I know coaches hate to make changes after wins. It just rarely happens. When do you think we see a split up of Hughes and Hironik? Yeah, it's tough. It's a tough one because they have been so great as a pairing together, but at the same time, you know, depending on how you look at your bottom two pairings, you're playing Mark Friedman, you know, arguably in the top four right now, if you've got him with Ian Cole. Yeah. And that's not a, a long term tenable solution. And it comes back to where they're at with their roster and why you would imagine they would like to move on from a player like Connor Garland because they need some cap flexibility so that they can help themselves, particularly on that right side of the blue line, whether it's Ethan Bear or something else going forward. But that is a clear area of weakness for this group right now. And if it continues to be an area of weakness, then to me, the best way to sort of stem that bleeding is to separate Hughes and Heronic so you have one of them on the ice for most of the game. But then you've got to look at, okay, who are you elevating to play with Hughes? If it's a right shot guy, does it make sense for Friedman or Myers to be playing with Hughes? I don't necessarily think so. I would like to see them move Ian Cole to the right side and, and see if that experiment could work, if he could play with Hughes. But at the same time, they're winning games right now. They're off to a 4-2 and two start. Uh, so you're not really going to, you know, pick holes in what Rick Tockett has done in terms of his deployment because it's leading to wins. I just worry in the long term, if you're playing both Hughes and Heronic 25 minutes a night like they have been, whether yeah. that's going to be sustainable. Yeah, that is true. Okay, I know the PK won't be 32nd overall this year. Uh, Nashville 0 for 3 on the power play. Had a couple of power plays uh, late in the third. They killed it off. Uh, it is so nice to finally see uh, PK in this city uh, that is competent. Yeah, it's and it's going to make a big difference for them in the long run. And think about this, you know, Carson Soucy was out for the first couple of games. Tim yep. Bluger hasn't played yet. He's going to be a key PK guy. mckayev has been out of the lineup. He can kill penalties as well. So, you know, on paper anyway, this penalty kill could only get better from here. And I've been saying for a couple of years, for the Canucks to have some more success, they don't need to have the best penalty kill in the league. They just don't need to have, you know, they need to have the, not worst. the worst penalty kill yeah. in the league. Right? Like, just be in the in the mid twenties or be, yep. you know, middle of the league, be average, and it won't be costing you points on a nightly basis. And we saw that so many times last year where uh they took a penalty, 
puck could be in the back of the net and it ends up being the game winning goal or it ends up turning the momentum in a game. And, you know, some of those leads they were blowing last year were in part because of some of the power play goals they were giving up. So to have a penalty kill that's solid, that's reliable, it's not perfect. It's not the best penalty kill in the league but you can rely on it to get the job done when you need it to is a game changer for this group. And if it continues to play this way, it will lead to them winning more games, earning more points than they did in past years when the penalty kill was costing them games. All right, get ready for the homestand. You'll be busy starting on Friday night. Sounds good. And uh, early congratulations to Donnie on whatever it is. I don't know, but it's uh, like stop it. So. Stop it. You see, now you're <laughs> tipping people off. Stop it. I, I didn't say anything. Uh, I didn't say anything. Uh, yeah, we're already getting ripped in the Delaney's <laughs> OK Tyron Langley inbox. Everyone's figured it out, but we're not going to say boo. Have a nice day. Thanks, Patch. Sounds good. Thanks, guys. All right.